Today, uh, if, you, if you came to my last talk, this is uh, going to be another uh, study that we did. In fact, uh, this was part of uh, Pad Padma uh, Pasipathy. She, uh, this is part of her master's thesis, and I was also involved in the project, so I'm here to, uh, to present it to you today. She's now working out in industry. Um, so uh, here's, a, here's a little recap of uh, when, we, when one of our other students went to TFPIE 2017. Um, these were all the audience members involved here, or the different people involved. And um, so this, the speaker was talking about something and then mentioned state, and this actually spawned a big debate about state and functional programming and what it means and you know whether we should be even teaching this to students and why don't you just teach them monads like normal people and people saying state is evil. Um, and so that's kind of sparked this idea um, of talking about state because if you're familiar with Elm, it uses this um, uses this runtime that essentially is a model view update. So you have a model which is kept in the runtime. So that's kind of like the state, and then you have um, an update function and a view function to render. Um, so we wanted to kind of. Uh, talk about, see if we can actually teach um, kids to learn about state diagrams and make interactive programs, um, um, basically students all the way down to grade four and five. So here are some of the research questions that she looked at. So do, do these students demonstrate an understanding of state diagrams, being able to translate between different representations? Um, are they able to demonstrate equal facility for con uh, converting from one representation to another? Um, and do they understand the role of reachability, so being able to get from um, the start state to maybe any state in the program or not? Um, and can we figure out with what confidence can we figure out that they actually do understand the idea of reachability? Um, next thing is, are they engaged by state diagrams? Is this something they even want to do or is it like too above their heads? Is it boring? Um, and do they understand abstract and concrete states really well? So um, an idea of, an, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but an abstract, an abstract state might be that the, they're making a game and the player is hungry, that's one of the states. Whereas a concrete state is like the player is in a certain place. Um, so those are more like places in that case. And will they be able to generalize to abstract, abstract states? So we did a little, the, some of the background research, we looked at different um, background research in lots of different fields, including uh, computer science research, um, and also even research into drawing and how that affects education. Um, so we found that computer science, one, one author um, tried to prove that computer science is as important as English and should be taught in, in elementary schools. In Ontario, just I believe in 2020 was the first time we introduced coding as a formal part of the actual um, uh, elementary school curriculum. So it's actually part of the math curriculum now. Um, but we need tools, what we're here to do is develop tools for teachers to help them actually teach. Um, Event-driven programming has been shown to be an effective way to teach beginners coding. Um, and the, another researcher found that students who learned through drawing scored higher than people who just learned through text. So we're hoping the visual, uh, visual aspect might be helpful. And also learning through drawing helps uh, people take, helps students take different perspectives um, and expose them to domains like math and literature when working in groups. So that's kind of some background. If you weren't here in the first talk, I'll quickly show this slide again. So we're uh, McMaster Start Coding. We deliver uh, programming lessons in Elm to students around our local area and also beyond now that we're doing virtual. We've taught over 25,000 students in the last five years alone. And we're run by mostly undergrad and graduate uh, student, student volunteers as well as high school volunteers. Um, and some we have some also uh, paid positions that we get through uh, partnerships with school boards to deliver some of their curriculum. So we've visited over a thousand classrooms in the last five years, uh, both in person before the pandemic and now uh, virtually. And when we go to schools, we don't get into too much depth, but it's really the summer camps where we're able to. So this tool was, um, was is something that we've used extensively in some of our summer camps where students can actually uh, go, go further. We have different camps. Uh, so things like the Adventure Game Camp, and this one's called Code Like Picasso, where they use Elm to make, um, this, is, this is an example of, uh, of a Picasso drawing that was done in Elm using our graphics library. So um, here are a few things that have actually been created by students uh, using this tool. So they made, um, we, we did a mystery game. I don't know if you can, you probably can't see these links, but if you, um, Hopefully, get the slides after. You can click those links and actually play the games that they made. So this one, I think they had to make a mystery game. This was called, uh, they, they named this character Baby Soda. Um, and it was all about trying to discover who stole uh, Baby Soda's soda. 
Um, so I think that's what the that game was about. So they had to go through, you had to go through and investigate all the different, um, and they made the state diagram and made all the paths um, t that the player could take. Um, so yeah, and then there's a video here about this one, and this is another game about social emotional learning, uh, using emojis to understand uh, the transitions between em emotions. I guess it's overly simplified, but uh, that's the idea. Um, so some of the advantages of, of our approach that we think are important. Uh, the first one is that our graphics library is compositional, which is really great, um, and, it, and Elm really lets us do this, because we can compose different shapes together, and then we can um, do apply transformations to them. So this is one of the tools that we have, where they can learn about our, our library just through a visual um, program, basically. And even students all the way down to uh, kindergarten have used this. Uh, they don't do any coding, but just by clicking through uh, the different shapes and applying transformations, the final code gets shown here, and the final shape also gets shown. So uh, we, we didn't think that it would be as engaging as it was, but uh, for example, I went to a grade two classroom one time, um, and they they actually just played with this for like over an hour and a half and they just really liked it. So even though they could only draw one shape at a time, they still really liked it. Um, the next thing is we, we, tr we like to call our approach algebraic thinking. So Elm really lets us do this. And what we mean by algebraic thinking is being able to break things down into their component parts. So for example, um, they can easily um, create, if they wanted to create like this little Pac-Man person um, here, they, would, they can create a player variable and then make three of them and do different, like rotate this one, move this one, and rotate and move this one, so you get three of the same thing. And this is a really natural way to introduce variables and functions um, in a way that's really concrete. It's like if I need to repeat a shape, it's gonna be a lot less work for me to just use a variable. It really motivates the use of variables. And later, um, if I want my Pac-Man, it's not shown here, but if I want my Pac-Man to be able to be different colors, uh, not just pink, um, I can introduce a, a variable and make it into a function. So it's a really natural way to introduce some of these higher level concepts, even to grade four students who've never seen really functions in math before. And the next thing, the last thing that we're trying to get into a little bit more with this tool is this idea of model-driven engineering. So they make the state diagram. Here's a pretty complex state diagram of a game that some of the students came up with. And um, from there, the code gets generated, some basic template code gets generated, and then they can add the graphics and animations and whatever they want um, on top of that. So um, it's, it's kind of almost model-driven engineering, I'd say. I think one part of model-driven engineering that we're not quite there yet with is when you do edit the state diagram, you have to regenerate the code and you'd have to do a bunch of copy-pasting. We're hoping to eventually have better editor support to um, avoid such things so that you, know, you can still edit your game um, without having to then copy the graphics back. So um, that's, that's one thing we're, we're, working on, we're working on for sure. Um, and students are able to use this to basically make a game from scratch in a week, over the week um, at one of our summer camps that we're offering. So um, that's really cool. Um, the first attempt at something like this was, so we had written this paper about this thing we called Petri App Land. It was a distributed um, system where you could make like multiplayer games and apps that used, that co-generated Haskell for the back end and Elm for the front end. Um, it was a little bit, we used it for our purposes. It was a little too complicated for, some, for students, so we decided to simplify. Um, and we added the state diagram tool to this, and then they ended up using that and really liking it. So then we tried to then take this and kind of simplify it. Um, even though it was complicated, the kids really liked it because they could use it. They could design their game and then generate the code and it allowed them to be creative um, and not worry about too many of the finiggly things like the syntax of how to make a case statement. All that stuff is kind of done for them. And even these buttons, um, they're just, really simple, but these buttons will take you from like the outside into the music room and into the, or sorry, outside, hallway, music room, gym, etc. I don't know if we have the state diagram for this, but they have defined um, transitions that allow you, that define what buttons show up here. So for example, outside says go inside, and that takes you to the hallway. And from there you have transitions like enter music room, enter gym. Um, sorry, they're a little bit small, but that's the idea. So they can define their game, and then they get the code pre-generated, and then obviously this is pretty boring, so they can make um, pictures to go with that. Or even they can change these buttons into more interesting things, like if you find a clue in your mystery game, like you might say, you know, find, try to find the clue on the screen. You have a bunch of objects, and clicking the right one is actually the button that takes you to the, um, where, you know, the state where you maybe you found the object, something like that. Okay, so in terms of the uh, challenge design that we did uh, to actually kind of 
see, we wanted to answer some of, those, some of those research questions. So the first thing we did was we taught them about state diagrams and we gave them some lessons and then we let them split into groups and they just were able to make their state diagrams uh, to come up with their basic adventure game. Some of them just got there, some of them started actually making graphics for it. And then I think after that they were pretty eager to continue the um, and, and keep learning, the teacher told us. And then so, uh, and then for the second day we went back, we gave them some challenges to see uh, if they're able to interpret and use state diagrams in different ways. So we have different challenges, like going from a paragraph ex explanation to actually making a state diagram. So we describe a game and see if they can make the state diagram. Um, a bullet point explanation, uh, this would be like, a bullet point would be just step by step, like all the different maybe um, transitions or states or those kind of things. Um, the next one would be, actually trans, like writing a paragraph about the state diagram. So they look at the state diagram and we'd ask them to write a paragraph to see if they understand what the state diagram does. Um, and then the next thing is actually playing a game and making the state diagram from the final game. So the first question was about, uh, do they understand um, the state diagrams, being able to translate between them? Um, for the most part, of course, this was a really small sample size. We'd, we want to scale this up and do a bigger, so take all these like answers with a, with a grain of salt. It's definitely not statistically significant, but what we were able to see is for the most part, students were able to um, translate um, between different representations. Um, so these are some examples of sort of what we thought were the median um, results uh, for, for some of these. Uh, challenges. Um, the next one it was about, however, uh, do they have equal facility? So we were interested in is are, are some representations easier than others? And that turned out to be uh, the answer to this question about are they able to do it equally? The answer is no. So students, um, for example, for the one where they had to translate from a state diagram to uh, English, they were confused about how much they should write. About the, about the game, especially if there was a loop somewhere in the game where you go back to a state, because then they thought, well, wait, but so they're writing and they go about the transitions and they get back to the beginning, they're like, well, do I keep writing? That kind of thing. Um, <laughs> so actually that showed they did understand the idea of cycles in the, in the, in the sort of infinite loops in the game. Um, but it, yeah, sometimes they were like, wait, wait, do I keep writing? And so, yeah. Um, we, actually, we also found it that when we wrote them in point form, this was something we expected, but when we wrote it in point form specifications rather than a paragraph, um, it was a lot easier for them to understand. So if we had, um, you know, uh, you have, we, we just listed the four states, like the hallway, the music room, the gym, and, and the, uh, whatever the other one was, and then we have bullet points saying from the outside, you can enter the hallway. From the hallway, you can enter this. From the hallway, you can enter, also enter this. So those ones were able, easier for them to understand than just a paragraph. Um, and it was really interesting to see, and maybe this is a result of them being familiar with adventure games, playing video, those sorts of video games, but the conversion from a working game into the state diagram actually seemed to be, um, so we basically, honestly, what we did, we just gave them the, we didn't really make any graphics or anything, we gave them this representation, and just by clicking through it, they were able to back, like, figure out the state diagram that goes with um, with the game that generated it, and so, um, or the game that was generated from that state diagram. So, uh, for the most part, they were able to do that better than all the other ones, which was really interesting to see as well. Um, the next thing is the can they understand the role of reachability? So the first uh, graph here. Um, is the number of states versus the number of transitions in all the diagrams that we looked at. So um, if you, all these dots down here would be programs that had more states than transitions, which means some of them are unreachable. Um, so, and some of these are probably abandoned because they only had like one, uh, maybe one transition or zero transitions, for example. Um, anything above this sort of y equals x line shows a more complex program where you have um, at least one transition per uh, state. And then anything along the y equals x line is, is basically like a tree uh, um, where you have almost pretty much one transition per, um, per state. And then um, the other thing we looked at, statistic we looked at, was the reachable states versus total states. So anything along this line here um, shows that all states are reachable, and anything below that means that there were some uh, states that weren't reachable. Uh, so for the most part, they were able to um, they had most, most states were reachable. Um, a few of them, these ones down here are likely, again, like abandoned diagrams where they maybe created a diagram and then just created another one because they were helping their group or something. Um, and for the most part though, they're along the line of, of, um, of you know, reachability. 
where, where all states are reachable from the start state. Um, so then we also asked, you know, is this actually statistically significant? So we did this, uh, this Anderson-Darling test, basically figuring out um, can we, if we generate a bunch of random state diagrams, how, how often are um, the states reachable and that kind of thing. And then we, um, so we simulated those and then we basically tried to figure out, you know, are they, are they understanding reachability more than just a random state diagram? That's kind of how we, that's what we set our, um, our test as being. If it's, are they, are they having more reach, are they more reachable on average than uh, a random state diagram? And we found that um, to a high degree of uh, probability they, they are, although, albeit with a small sample size. Um, and then the next thing is, um, are they engaged by this uh, idea of adventure games? And uh, what we found was a lot of students actually kept going and actually kept um, making diagrams. And so these are probability distributions of, of all the different um, uh, groups and the number of states and transitions they have. Um, so uh, several groups actually kept working. We kept watching them and they kept adding more and more states. Um, after, even after the class visit, so that was really interesting. And we've since used this tool with lots of other camps and groups, and they always seem to, to really enjoy it. Um, and then the next thing was the idea of abstract and concrete states. So um, we basically just analyzed by hand, analyzed their diagrams and figured out how many concrete and, and abstract states. And what we found is the groups that kept working on their game generally got into more abstract states. So those are the ones kind of up here where uh, you ended up with a lot more abstract states. And these, by abstract, I mean things like um, they were using states to represent how much health their character had and that kind of thing. And um, yeah, but what was interesting, we just put this line here, which is roughly um, the line where there are three times as many uh, abstract as concrete. None of the groups seem to go past that kind of line, which was just kind of an interesting little uh, tidbit. Okay, and that's about it. Again, this was uh, kind of an initial research into this tool to figure out if this is a viable thing. We wanna uh, continue to work on this and continue to sort of uh, both develop the tool and also uh, curriculum for the teachers to use it and then also uh, sort of continue to prove that this is uh, uh, something valuable um, to them learning both uh, computer science and uh, maybe other concepts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Do we have time for questions? We, have, uh, we actually need to catch up on schedule. Oh, so, sorry. <laughs> uh, let's have one question. one question. Sure. And while we are on it, I will go through uh, everyone and collect the vote. Uh, I wanted to <clears throat> ask you if you think that, uh, in general, functional languages can be used to teach children programming more efficiently? And if that's the case, why is it that way? Mm, that, that's a good question. Uh, this was a similar question to what someone asked in the last talk. What we've found, uh, for us, it seems to work really well. Uh, first of all, Elm just has a kind of a nice, pretty easy declarative syntax. So they, they write out their, um, I had a little bit about the library, but they write out their, um, function, their shapes and um, the different um, transit, um, I'm blanking on the word, the different uh, transformations of the shapes, so they write it out kind of all declaratively. Um, what we've also found is that because we're, um, we can't just, the, the one thing is we can't just go into schools, oh, we can a little bit more now because there's the coding's in the curriculum, but before especially when the coding, when coding wasn't in the curriculum, we couldn't really justify taking up some of the teacher's time when, when they need to teach other things. Uh, we needed to support the existing math curriculum as well, or even the literature, we can do, we can do like literature things as, as well. So um, we find that Elm matches their intuition about math a lot better because it's, uh, it's more, um, because everything is so kind of static rather than dynamic and there's no sort of hidden state like in an imperative language. Um, so that was also something that we, that we also needed was something that, is, um, that matches their intuition. And I gave the example in the last talk, um, so sorry if you were here, but one of the students, we taught them how to make a shape blink from one color to another just by putting an if statement in where the color is. Well, they realized on their own that they can just take that if, sorry, did I say statement before? That was bad. Expression, uh, the if expression, they can take that if expression and put it in anywhere. They realize that they could just put that in the top level list and then they can actually flip between two different shapes, for example. Um, so we find, I, our personal experience has been that it has been very good for teaching. Uh, we obviously don't get into anything too crazy at the beginning. We teach them our very basic DSL, but the nice thing is they can build right up from 
very simple things all the way up to a full-blown web app because after all it's just Elm, it's not a teaching language per se, it's a full-blown programming language, so yeah. It looks like there are plenty of resources there that Yes, that's another thing someone asked. So there are resources, our website. If you go to our website uh, here, rh.mcmaster.ca, this is also our, our foundation website that we've just started, our nonprofit that teaches, that teaches people and um, that kind of thing. And then you can also email us if you want access to our online coding system, if you want to try it out, um, or uh, to talk about maybe starting your own uh, using this in classrooms if you're interested. So uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you very much.